Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ana Nieto. I'm the head of the Species Conservation Action Team here at IUCN, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. You might have joined us at other webinars, but this time we wanted to do something a little bit different. Today, we will be talking about human wildlife conflict and particularly on the interface between practice and policy. As some of you might know, the biodiversity targets of the post 2020 global biodiversity policy framework will be adopted in a matter of days during COP15 in Montreal. And getting these targets approved is, is, is a quite long and complicated process, but it is of crucial importance to get them right if we want to enable more effective conservation action on the ground and improved human wildlife conflict mitigation. And it may not always be obvious that connection between policy and practice, but effective biodiversity policy is fundamental for any conservation project to be successful. And these biodiversity policies have to be developed using information from the ground. So in this webinar today, we're inviting our grantees from the IUCN Save Our Species and the Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation Program to present lessons from the field on human wildlife conflict and coexistence. We want to discuss how conservation can influence policy in regard to human wildlife conflict. And our aim is really to create a dialogue, an exchange of ideas that our colleagues attending COP15 can bring to the table. We should be able to have a say in the creation of the policies that will ultimately impact our work. So to start us off, I would like now to introduce you to our host, Dr. Alex Zimmerman, Chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission Human Wildlife Conflict and Coexistence Specialist Group. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you to the SOS team for organizing this this webinar today, as always, it's my pleasure to join, um, not least because it's always wonderful to hear from projects working on human wildlife conflict on the ground, the day to day difficulty of doing that. Um, and we are going to hear from three excellent SOS projects today um, with some very nice stories and examples of the kind of uh, work that is happening on the ground. But it's also um, exciting to talk about this at this very time because Anna, as Anna just uh, introduced, it is very, very timely on the global stage. So there are, and, and so I'm kind of here also to provide a little bit of that global background context. Um, and then at the end of this um, session, we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion with our speakers and with you um on on some of the questions around how do we work on this huge problem for biodiversity globally so let me first give a quick intro to this presentations we're going to hear about um i will in a minute give a little bit of a global background setting but we are after me going to hear from three sos projects from namibia uh india and bangladesh and zambia we will hear from russell vinewald um, from his work on human lion conflict in Namibia. We will hear about protecting tigers and people in the Sundarbans from Meja Nayak. And we will then hear from um, Dennis Zimba about working on human elephant conflict in Zambia. So before we go there, let me try and give a very quick um, background on what is happening on the global stage in this topic. So, as mentioned, this is extremely timely um, because what the situation we have, as all of you who are interested in human wildlife conflict and working on this topic, is that this is truly a global biodiversity challenge and a challenge for people around the world, millions and millions of people. Um, it is Human wildlife conflict is an issue in every single country, not just in certain parts of the world. Um, can we go back up? Thank you. Um, it is, if you take just, for example, the elephant range states in Africa and Asia, that's 50 countries, one quarter of the world is struggling with coexisting with elephants. This is a very real on the ground challenge. We're gonna hear one of those examples later today. And it affects a huge range of species. We tend to focus on the iconic high profile ones, but it is everything from, from different species of fish, birds, all sorts. And of course, enormous, uh, numbers of people and communities heavily affected. So next slide, please. 
the the one thing I'm going to say, as I always do, uh, right at the start, is we've got to be very clear that although what we see in human wildlife conflict is a, a clash between species and people of some form, something happens that causes the situation, the conflict that is going on is between different groups of people about what should be done. And that is such a crucial and core element to this issue in conservation that this has to come into um, certainly uh, also the, the projects, but also the policy. And I'll talk about that in a second. And the reason we've got, we're facing this at such a scale at the moment is that there's been a number of conservation successes recently. Take, for example, the recovery of um, carnivores in Europe, the recovery of tigers in Nepal. Um, and as this happens, conflict inevitably follows. And what we're not yet doing is looking at how do we actually anticipate and prevent that. Next slide, please. So the conventional biological diversity, which uh, for which COP15 is happening in under two weeks time in Montreal, the overall arching vision for this is living in harmony with nature. Of course, that has at its essence um, an, a need to coexist with wildlife and with biodiversity in all its ways. And so, of course, human wildlife conflict is absolutely crucial to that. Um, next slide, please. And so what is very exciting in this particular topic at the moment is the fact that for the first time ever, human wildlife conflict as a conservation issue has entered explicitly into the text of the convention. So the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which contains 21 targets in its current draft, has um, explicit mention of human wildlife conflict. It is under target four, which is the target dealing with species. And the text of this is currently very much in, um, in discussion. So uh, if you, any of you have been following this, you'll be aware of how uh, convoluted the text is right now. There are a lot of brackets and different wordings. This is an image from meetings earlier this year um, where uh, all the 196 parties were debating the text and that is ongoing. So, and even just on, you know, we're talking just about one component about, of one target here, but even this has gone through a long evolution. And so just to give you a quick background, it has moved a little bit around the targets, but um, if you could press the next on the slide, the current text, which, uh, which has a number of brackets because parties are debating exact wording. For example, some countries feel that we should be call, we should be referring to coexistence rather than conflict. Some feel that we should talk about avoiding it and so on. These are the negotiations that are going on. But what matters here, and and IUCN of course through um, is is inputting into this and in our position statement, this is from all of IUCN as a whole. Um, we are recommending wording, for example, to simplify this current long wording to. Um, a shorter version, which would say if, that the aim is to effectively manage human wildlife conflict and coexistence. However, it is going to be up to the parties to decide how they want to word that. So that's where we are at the moment. Now, the next big, big challenge in all of this is that all targets have to be measured. So all parties later on will, after the um, framework comes into force, have to try and measure their situation of human wildlife conflict. And this is where it gets very, very difficult. And this is where um, I'm keen to have some discussion later as well. How do you do this? You're dealing with 196 countries. Some are dealing with elephants, some are dealing with cormorants. Um, it's, there's a huge differences in scale, in complexity. Every case of human wildlife conflict is different, even within a country. So this is the, the big challenge up ahead. I could have the next slide. And then coming back to this first point that it is conflict between people and people. Um, if you could just press the, the next couple of animations there. I put too many pieces into the slide, unfortunately. So what we have is, an, you know, the first reaction is to measure just how much damage is done, how much economic loss there is, how many people are affected. That's the obvious, that does need to be measured. But how do we measure the actual conflicts between people. And how do you do that across all countries? This is where it gets really quite tricky. 
And this is where we actually need as many minds and thinkers as possible to come together from different perspectives and help out and figure out how to do this. Next slide, please. Um, and so actually, if you could just skip through this one, thank you. What we've, we've spent a lot of time in the human wildlife conflict specialist group thinking about this, engaging with the post 2020 framework of the secretariat of the CBD um, organizations such as WWF and WCMC who are working on this um, and really trying to make sure that in the development of such an, of an indicator for human wildlife conflict it is really important to keep in mind what really matters in this, what are we trying to get to long term um, and to try and weave in the social, the political, as I've just said, but also to really encourage to make this entire thing a participatory process so that lots of organizations and countries are involved in figuring out how they need to and want to measure this. So this is currently in development. I'll spare you this, this uh, additional tedious text, but currently the indicator that we're proposing from IUCN, it is not the current wording, but we're proposing that the indicator for human wildlife conflict should be something along the lines of um, keeping an eye on the trends in effective and sustainable management of human wildlife conflict. Okay, how would you do that? And this is, I'm just gonna show you what, where we've got to so far. This has been through working with organizations and, and several countries as well, is we're proposing, this is the first draft of an idea, where this is open for lots and lots of inputs, is that there are three components to doing this. The first would be the obvious, measure the incidences, what's happened. The second is to measure the human, the social, the political, the cultural element. What is the extent to which countries, communities are willing and able to coexist with people? And the third um, is to actually get a sense for the quality of the engagement process, because any of you who have worked on human wildlife conflict on the ground in real life know that it is all about engagement, about co-design. If you want a sustainable human wildlife coexistence, it's got to be co-designed. And so I think that also needs to be captured in any kind of um, global indicator. But as I said, this is a first draft um, and happy to, well, it needs lots and lots of minds. So I'm looking forward to working with many, many people and organizations through the specialist group to continue this. Okay, so that was a quick, very quick uh, background on, on what's happening in, in the uh, post-2020 framework in terms of human wildlife conflict. And then just very quickly, in case you haven't had a chance to look at what IUCN is doing on human wildlife conflict through the specialist group, we actually have a, a huge amount of resources available, which I'll run you through very quickly. These are the the links to the website. And this is, of course, again, uh, trying to bring the global together, trying to provide this to uh, global um, forums like the, the COP. There's this website. Um, do have a look at it if you haven't seen it. It has enormous amounts of resources. It's used in almost every country. There's a newsletter. Uh, it's, this is constantly updated. Policy-wise, we have IUCN's position statement on human wildlife conflict in four languages. It's the, all of this I'm telling you is on the website. You can go and find it. There's issue brief. This is more for policymakers and journalists, for example, and a lot of documents that have been fed into the, the CBD post 2020 framework. Do have a look if you're interested in the policy side of human wildlife conflict. And Similar to the kinds of projects we're going to hear about today, we have done a, a huge study, a, a huge project on um, positive examples of creating human wildlife coexistence. These are case studies um, that feature kind of the lessons learned from different parts of the world. This has been done in collaboration with um, the FAO of the UN together with the specialist group. They're all online as well. And finally, in well, in March of next year, we will be hosting IUCN with a specialist group and many other partners, including um, the World Bank, UNDP, and then lots of others will be hosting the first ever big international conference on human wildlife conflict. This, of course, will follow 
three months after the COP, so a lot of the policy um, discussions we're having now can, will then be followed on there. That's all from me. Um, we are now going to hear, I'm going to hand over to our three speakers. We're going to hear um, about these wonderful three examples. And so I would say let's get started. At this point, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Russell Vignabog. Welcome, Russell. Russell is the Human Wildlife Support Team Coordinator and is going to talk to us about his work. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Alex, thanks very much for that. I thought that was pretty succinct, uh, succinctly put, a lot of good information there. Uh, bear with me. I've got a lot that I would like to share with you, and I will be touching on a bit later, a bit more on the policy side of things, but rather at the moment put quite a lot of context to, to, to what we're doing and how we're doing it in our area. Um, we operate up in the northwestern part of Namibia. Um, pretty much a dry area, rainfall gradient uh, east to west, starting 400 odd moles in the map you can see there, down to less than 100 moles in the desert. Um, a bit lower down on there, we actually mark freehand the, the lion range area in yellow. It's quite, a, um, quite an extensive area, about 50, 55,000 square kilometers. Bear in mind, this is not formal conservation area. This is all um, sort of rural communal land. Um, the next couple of pictures provide us just with a few samples of the, the kind of really um, vast, rugged and inhospitable area that we're looking at. Um, it's, it's pretty arid, not that much vegetation. And uh, even going to the next pic with a, a slide there, a satellite image um, of the lower Huanab, Namib Desert, a lot of rocks, a lot of sand, much else, but there's lions out there. Um, rainfall is obviously one of the, the big limiting factors in this area. And on this slide, you can see the from about 2012 going right through um, to the present. We've been um, having a pretty serious drought situation. Um, and that's influenced just about everything. You know, when you look at the vegetation, um, we, we look at the NDVI images, that will be next pick there. Um, okay, on the, the left-hand side is just the NDVI stuff from, from um, the last rain season, beginning of this year. But on the right-hand side, that just shows the deviation from the long-term mean. Um, and all those pink bars on below the line, that's not great. And of course, this impacts our key prey species. So you can see on the, the next set of graphs there, just key prey species from Chemsbok, which are Oryx, uh, Hartman zebra, Kudu, Springbok, over the same period, numbers have just declined dramatically. And it's gonna take quite a while for those numbers to be, to be picked up again. Um, yeah, and of course, this has had a major impact on, um, on farmers as well, as you can see, Farmers lost a tremendous amount of livestock um, during the same period, um, hugely catastrophic. Um, and then, of course, you know, when predators come and eat your last remaining livestock, that's not very good. Predators also took a major hammering on this um, lioness here who came out of the hills and um, approached a kraal with livestock in but was too weak to even get in. Um, this happened a couple of times, and in fact, we actually had to move um, some lines away to refuges rather than just let them die. Um, we also had, for the first time in, in 30 odd years, uh, 40 odd years, we had some attacks on humans. Um, we had three attacks in 2021, 2022. Fortunately, no one was killed, but, you know, this was also just purely as a result of the incredible, um, the incredible um, decrease in prey species. Yeah, it's a bit scary when those things happen and it doesn't help your, your popularity ratings at local level. Yeah, it makes it just more difficult to operate there. At the moment in our area there, we operating on the, the um, 
Northwest Human Line Conflict Management Plan. And um, out of that plan, this was a ministry document from the Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Tourism. Okay, we are focusing on five different aspects there. The first is Lion Ranger program, kraals, predator-proof kraals, developing and implementing an early warning system, and then, of course, response to, to the early warning, and then community. Um, cannot, cannot overstate the importance of relationships with local communities in, in these areas. Remember, not national parks, these are, are rural areas. Um, we see this as just several pieces in, 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 in a, a multifaceted jigsaw puzzle. And it's got to tie in with other complementary efforts. So we are looking at contractual, contractual people's parks. Um, we're looking at the possibility of moving lions out of critical areas. We're also looking at uh, surveys every couple of years, attitudinal surveys with um, communities just to, to see, are we on the right track? What can we do better? What can we do differently? Lion Ranger program, pretty simple, um, based on, on some work being done in, in, in other countries as well. Community-based, the, the Lion Rangers are worked for and are responsible to the community and do a lot of monitoring and response work. You can just see a, a group of them being briefed briefly before they're going out on a patrol. Um, crowds, we, we use a system we identified early on that farmers need a, a predator-proof crowds or assistance. Remember, most of our area is arid to, to hyper-arid. There's not much natural vegetation to use in the construction of crowds. So this is a, a critical aspect. And then, of course, herding and making sure farmers are using the crowds. Um, we also tend to put up lights with the crawls. We find that those are being quite effective, um, both in terms of, of um, intimidating livestock, but also in terms of boosting confidence with farmers. You can just see the materials we use, robust construction. Here. Early warning system, we looked at developing some sort of system that would allow community members and conservation practitioners to, to be aware of, of kind of potential or impending situations on the ground. And of course, the, the system that we've come up with over time now is, is based, the most fundamental aspect is collars, putting collars on, on animals. And in this case, the more the merrier, particularly key individuals in key prides and of course in key areas. Two different types of collars we use. The first is a satellite GPS collar. Um, these are used a lot for geofencing as well. Um, they are pretty expensive, but they're well worth the effort getting them. We have a cheaper GPS early warning collar, and that just um, triggers off towers um, which we put up what we call an early warning logger unit. These are towers that we put up at um, key farms or problem areas, hotspot areas. And you'll see one on the next slide there, what they look like. These are when a collar comes to within a couple of kilometers, the tower picks up its presence, starts interrogating the collar, and then through a system of lights and sirens actually warns the farmer of the presence or approach of the collar, allowing for the first time farmers to actually be proactive in their response rather than waking up and, and there's lion in their crowd. Of course, a lot of this is um, has to be communicated and we have in our response teams, um, a communications, dedicated communications unit in their vehicles. Um, they can communicate with each other. Remember, there's, there's no or very little cell phone network in those areas. Um, these units are, have a built-in GPS. They receive messages of, of violations directly from the server. And they also, with a GPS, they can actually guide our, our teams, our response guys, right to where the problem is. At the moment, we are sitting with 16 early warning log towers deployed throughout the area. 
And these are mobile. They can be moved very quickly. If we suddenly find lines have moved into an area and are providing some problems and challenges, we can actually move a tower in there within hours to assist the farmers. The geofencing side of things, you can just see a whole system of geofences there. When there's a violation and a, a satellite collar moves in there, um, messages are sent to our, our um, response teams and to key individuals in the communities, allowing them to respond. Um, in the next picture, you can see a couple of lines, the, the movement pattern there in two months. I, I wanted to actually bring it over from March right until now, but it became too cluttered. These, this is a group of lines that have moved into an area, and it's a farming area. And it's, it's almost schizophrenic in the sense that during the day, it's, it's people, children, livestock, and at night, it is zebras and lions. Um, but we've got a full-time team and a crew based in that area, and we've managed to um, minimize losses there up to now. In fact, we've had some livestock losses there, but they were due to a leopard, not lions. Of course, monitoring the whole um, early warning system is critical, and we monitor the, both the geofence violations and the early warning system tower triggers, and we try and measure our physical response, and then also just some certain um, areas we just monitor to see what is going on there. So from uh, June 21 to October 22, we've had some 256 triggers and yeah, we managed to maintain a, a, about a 70, 75% um, physical response, which is pretty good. Yeah, we, we, we do keep records and monitor as far as possible, not always that easy with the communications and the vast distances, but yes, we do have some, some interesting data and, and figures on livestock losses, et cetera. See that in context, though, wild livestock losses to, to lions have decreased. Livestock losses to drought have also decreased. So we must just balance that. Um, a large part of what we do is also supporting the, the communities there. This is just taking children to school in an area that the lions moved into for a while. And so we had to help and assist there as far as possible and provide support. Um, I mentioned some of our complementary sort of activities. We are looking at the, the development of contractual people's parks. Um, and this is just one of them. There's another two that we're working on, providing more space for wildlife, um, okay, areas where there will be less conflict, obviously. Also, attitudinal surveys. We finished just recently uh, an attitudinal surveys with um, communities, gave us a lot of information, um, what we're doing wrong, what we can improve on, what we're doing right. So, you know, that, this is something that these, these surveys were designed that we can do these again in a couple of years time, three, four years time and, and monitor our progress. That's pretty much, what I have to say, I just think, you know, following on from what Alex says, and I've mentioned here briefly our challenges with drought, et cetera, these, these are likely to, to become even more significant with climate change. We're acutely aware of that. Um, and, you know, the challenge comes on trying to blend ambition with reality, I think. Thanks very much, folks. Um, yeah, I look forward to some questions. Thank you very, very much for, for that excellent, interesting presentation. I'm going to move us straight uh, on to the next one. I see some uh, questions appearing and hands up. Save your questions for the end. We'll bring everybody together. Thank you very much, Russell. Um, let's go straight on to um, the work of Meja Nayak, who's head of Division of Human Wildlife Conflict at WTI, Wildlife Trust of India. Have we got you there? Yes, great. Um, he's going to talk to us about protecting tigers and people and vital habitats in the Sundarbans. Over to you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, so, so basically, uh, it was a it was a privilege, and uh, I'm extremely delighted to be here uh, this afternoon in India, right now. 
And uh, so our project in Sundarbans basically talks about uh, protecting habitats of, uh, for, for tigers, tigers and how we can ensure that with people. And uh, here I'm going to talk about uh, the landscape in two different countries. And here it's just a brief about uh, what, what, what all projects we have been doing with IUCN. And this is a ITHCP project. And uh, we had our Bangladesh partner had some, had some uh, projects with USAID in the similar landscape. So here is how uh, Sundarbans basically looks like. It's a delta. It's a delta in the east of uh, India, as you can see in the picture. The blue ones are in Bangladesh part and the green ones are in India. About, uh, it's a 40, 60 ratio it covers. And uh, you can move to the next one. Okay, so this is a uh, talks about the landscape. It's basically the only uh, Delta landscape where you find uh, tigers and it's one of the largest one. And it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a Ramsar site. There's all, all, all sorts of uh, protected status in there. But then this, this particular place faces a lot of threats, whether it comes from climate change, from pollution, from poverty, and uh, there is a huge dependence of local people on the natural resources there. So if you have to imagine the area that I just showed you before sometime, it is 10,000 square kilometer, and out of which 60% lies in Bangladesh. And the tiger numbers there is between 60 to um, 100 tigers in India, whereas in Bangladesh, it's somewhere, the estimate somewhere calls it between 84 to 130. So here I would like to focus on two things that this, these local people are not only bothered by the tigers in the landscape, but also by crocodiles. And they are severely affected by all sorts of climate emergencies and crisis that we talk about these days. So here, just to, just to give you another, uh, another uh, uh, share of how all the newspaper or the media clips look like from this patch of the country or or the other side of the uh, Sundarbans, which is in Bangladesh. Basically, it mostly talks about how tiger is attacking people, how people are banned from going into these forests, <clears throat> and how, how it affects their livelihood practices. Similarly, you can see that tiger widows is something which people are talking about now, that there, there are a lot of people who are affected by uh, who who have like lost their lives to tiger. So these are basically talking about the threats. Now let us see how how basically this sort of a conflict occurs when there is a when there is an interaction between the human and the tiger. When does it happen? When the tiger goes out from the forest. When the tiger gets out of the forest. Similarly, when humans come out, humans humans go into the forest. So basically in this, in this uh, probably there's another uh, picture which I do not see appearing on the, on the right side. I don't know why, but that was a picture of a, of a man, of course. So, uh, so anyway, that doesn't, uh, so here basically I wanted to say that when, when tiger comes out of the forest, all humans go into the forest looking for livelihood options. That is when all this sort of interaction happens and that increases their vulnerability to injuries and death. So here we thought of uh, how to reduce human tiger conflict. The first thing that is to reduce the dependence of local people to the forest. And how do we develop better attitudes, positive attitudes towards the tigers? Next. So here are a few key strategies that we tried to implement on this landscape. So the first one was uh, to, um, to, to promote um, like uh, to promote uh, and prevent tiger, like to prevent tiger movement in human habitation. Second was to reduce human intrusion into tiger habitat, provide early warning system just before sometime in my previous uh, presenter was talking about early warning systems. And then we kind of build a resilient community. And uh, further, we also sensitize youth and children who will be the future of this particular landscape. So we make them aware and we engage with them to develop and cultivate such positive attitudes towards 
diverse. And the last one is learning and sharing, which we do through a lot of uh, not not only inland or not only inter-country, not only intra-country um, explorations, but we also go transboundary. We have a Bangladesh team coming into India and India team going into Bangladesh and co-learning about, about their spaces and about our spaces. Okay, next. So here I would like to uh, show you a little bit more on how do we uh, basically prevent tiger movement. We have started installing nylon net fencing. Right now we have about, um, about five kilometer of nylon net fencing, which acts as a physical barrier between, between uh, the, the tigers coming out of the forest and straying into human habitations. The second is we have also put some uh, solar lights, solar lights in those uh, villages, in those vulnerable villages where we had incidences of tigers straying into these landscapes. But after solar lighting, these have considerably reduced. So uh, when we have to when we have to deter people or when we have to tell people that please do not go into the forest, we have to also understand that they are going into forest in search of livelihood. So that is the major dependence of people on Sundaban landscapes. So here the first thing that we do is is to give them some alternative income generation options. So we tell them that you what all alternatives are up, are there and it can be equally uh, rewarding. It could be equally remunerative if you explore these options. And uh, we did a lot of surveys and focus group discussions on what they would like to do and what options are available to them. And then here you in this picture, you can uh, you can see that there's a lady who has who has started mushroom cultivation. On the other hand, on the other picture on the left, you can see that you can see that uh, she is basically cooking using an improved cook stuff. Improved cook stuff, basically the dependence on the forest is also on the firewood. So here to reduce the usage of firewood, we have started started giving them improved cook stuff options. Next. So here uh, we were just talking about early warning system. Here also we are implementing early warning system. This is this is from our partners in in Bangladesh. Wild team is using Tiger Hotline, and uh, that is where people relay information from the local communities, and uh, and their information further goes down to whosoever uh, will be the one to uh, kind of intervene and uh, do the needful. Similarly, we, uh, while we are trying to create uh, resilient communities, we have gone down to speak to a lot of people in schools, colleges, in villages. So that is where we have started building up primary response teams or community response teams or village response teams. So we have called it differently in different landscapes so that it, it is acceptable to most, most groups. So that is how we engage them for camera trapping activities. We engage with them in crowd management and we do a lot of um, orientation and trainings. For example, if there has been a smaller case and smaller injury to someone, so how do you make a first aid? How do you inform the forest department of a tiger movement? Or for example, some other wildlife has moved out, has been displaced for some reason. How do we take care of it? And these small things that we start connecting with people and then we start building. It's not only a rapper building exercise, but also a trust building. And so that we can take mitigation measures forward, which will be sustainable. So here again, while talking about uh, the future, the future generation of, of conservation is not conservationists only, but of the local community. These are the people, those who will be taking decisions in future. Here is a child talking about tigers. He has a book, tiger book in his hand. We have developed some movies and uh, comic books for children in school. And uh, we have done a lot of awareness programs in schools where we have uh, tried to find measurable outcomes. We have done a, a lot of surveys with kids so that they know that what, what exactly their learning has been through these awareness programs. We have not been like, uh, not been like only telling them, but also trying to find out that whether this learning is sustaining with them or not, whether they are retaining this training or not. And we give them a lot of visual tools and that they can carry back and look back into it and keep thinking about whatever we had spoken about or whatever they have in their landscape, they can come back to relate to it. Next. 
yeah, this is a comic book. And here in, in, in the last stage, in the last key strategy that we implement in this particular landscape is about learning and sharing. So when, well, so we do not only believe in restricting our knowledge to the local level, we believe in sharing. So here, since we have partners from Bangladesh and India, so uh, transboundary exposure has always been taken forward through this project. And uh, in the last first phase of the project also, we had a lot of transboundary activities. This in the second phase of the project, also we had, uh, we initiated some transboundary activities very recently. Uh, they have been running um, uh, Sundarbans Education Center in Bangladesh. In India also, we are developing Sundarbans Education Center for children to engage, for youth to engage. And these kind of exchange programs are the best platforms where these kind of these kind of transboundary exposures can happen, and people can co-learn and uh, share their learnings and kind of implement them in their landscapes as well. And uh, we also included uh, policymakers in one of those transboundary activities, where where uh, National Tiger Conservation Authority was also a part of this particular event, which you can see in the right side of the picture. Okay, and here I'm almost coming to the end of uh, end of our projects where where I would again like to just that I mentioned about policymakers. This this takes me to the policy. So here before some time, Alex was telling us about the target four. So basically our project talks about effectively managing human wildlife interactions by uh, reducing the human wildlife conflict. So here you can see in the small graph <clears throat> where you can see that uh, so how how human injury and human death has been uh, not human injury basically so human death has been reducing in the last two years and I know this is not a big enough trend to really tell that okay this has been reducing to a considerable degree but but this is only a comparison to just show you that still the the, the numbers or the number of cases have lowered and it will, and we hope that it will lower in the future days when we will be able to cultivate ideas of coexistence and inculcate values of coexistence back into these people. And we will have a better, better models that can be repli replicable and uh, will be always ready to scale up. So, so thank you, thank you everyone uh, for patient hearing and uh, that's all about it. And I thank all our partners and uh, uh, with and uh, my, my, my partners in uh, Bangladesh and uh, everyone at WTI for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mera, so much for that fascinating presentation. It was wonderful to hear. Um, how comprehensive and holistic this this project is um, also good Thank to hear you. those monitoring examples again at the end as with the previous speaker i'm gonna move us straight along quickly because we have uh we have a limited time and we want to have time for a discussion at the end um we've go now going to hear from our third sos project if uh dennis zimba is there i'd like to introduce dennis who is um the human human carnivore conflict mitigation officer of the Zambian Carnivore Program, and he's going to tell us about um, his team's work. Over to you, Dennis. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, my name is Azimba Dennis. I'm Human Carnivore Conflict Officer for the Zambian Carnivore Program, and I'll be taking you through the South Luangwa Human Carnivore Conflict Week, and thank you so much for having me on this very important program. Um, so we'll start by uh, just highlighting uh, the vision and uh, mission for the Zambian Carnival Program. Then I'll go on to talk about uh, the human carnival conflict uh, situation in the South Luangwa ecosystem. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the problems that we've identified and the opportunity that is there for us to mitigate some of those problems. Then I'll go on to discuss some of uh, uh, the mitigations that we're rolling out for various forms of carnival conflict across the ecosystem. We'll talk about some of the, the lessons that we've incurred uh, in mitigations implementation and some of uh, the challenges of this incurred. Then I'll just end by uh, highlighting some of our key partners for this very important work. 
The vision for the Zambian Carnival Program is uh, a restored and thriving ecosystem that are objectively conserved by local communities, scientists, and policy makers through evidence-based approaches. And uh, there's a lot that is going on across various ecosystems in our country to see to it that the vision is fulfilled. The mission for the Zambian Carnival Program is to conserve Zambia's large carnivals and the ecosystem they reside in through science. That's basically identifying various limiting factors and uh, um, threats to the large carnivals and their ecosystem, and uh, taking action as advised by research, then strengthening local leadership and promoting coexistence between communities and large carnivals. History has it that uh, the communities around this ecosystem never used to keep livestock because of uh, the prevalence of so many pests and diseases. This took a lot of interventions from the government to try and control the situation, after which a few people started coming from outside uh, with a few livestock as they were coming in search for pasture and land for farming. Uh, after the local people noticed that people who were coming in with livestock uh, well, scored success in livestock keeping. They also started learning and the current situation that we have is uh, nearly everybody wants to benefit from keeping livestock. But um, the livestock that came into this particular ecosystem came with uh, a lot of challenges uh, in that uh, uh, the people that started learning the practice did not account for the presence of so many carnivores that we have across the ecosystem. And because of improper heading practices, livestock slipping out of the enclosure or in poorly constructed enclosures, this resulted into an increase in livestock predation, property damage, and some cases of human injuries and death across the ecosystem. Human carnival conflict has come with uh, so many problems uh, across the ecosystem uh, in that uh, it negatively affects uh, human livelihood. You realize that the, uh, the livestock that uh, most communities keep is meant to pay school fees for their children, help in agriculture, or even act as an alternative source of protein. And this implies that uh, when the community loses livestock to predation by the carnivores, uh, they are highly affected. It's also a serious threat to human life in that we've recorded so many cases of human injuries and death. And people's daily activities are also affected when they uh, know the lions are in their area. It's also a negative effect on the carnivores themselves because the community may retaliate anytime if they know uh, the carnivores are in their area. It also results into a public relations disaster between us as conservationists and uh, uh, the community as a result of a change in perception about uh, the important work that we do and the carnivores generally. Uh, the beauty is uh, there is an opportunity for us to thrive together if we can uh, co-create mitigation tools with the community and reduce the cost for communities living with large carnivores, reduce adverse effects on large carnivores, and of course, promote coexistence between large carnivores and uh, the community. After following up on various forms of carnival conflict across uh, the ecosystem, we learned that there was a gap in uh, knowledge uh, on carnivores and basically how the community uh, can handle some of uh, the carnival conflict uh, that is experienced across the ecosystem. And to help us address some of those challenges, we uh, embarked on uh, various types and levels of community engagement programs ranging from uh, community forecast group uh, discussions, community radio, uh, community meetings, uh, and um, uh, these are very important tools for us to just raise awareness on uh, carnival conservation and how best communities can mitigate some of the problems that are incurred from living with uh, large carnivals. We conducted the survey uh, and uh, this survey uh, demonstrated to us that uh, the biggest form of carnival conflict that we have across the ecosystem is uh, uh, livestock predation, and uh, actually it's a motivating factor for all other forms of conflict because the carnivores, as they move about into human settlement areas, they would move because they're basically searching for food and food that looks similar to what they harvest from uh, the wild is basically the livestock that people keep. So after learning that uh, livestock uh, um, is, livestock predation is the main problem, 
we also learned that uh, the main cause of this problem is uh, improper heading practices and uh, livestock slipping out of enclosure or in poorly constructed enclosures. And to help us address that problem, uh, we designed and uh, started to build uh, demo predator proof enclosures in conflict to hotspots to help reduce on livestock predation. And uh, the basic design that we have uh, is basically uh, a design that uh, helps us to reduce livestock predation uh, for pigs, goats, and sheep. After rolling out the first set of uh, the predator-proof enclosures across the ecosystem, uh, we also learned that uh, the community is uh, also very proactive to the teachings that uh, we give, but uh, there was a lesson that we drew from that. As uh, you can see, the after development, after the adoption of uh, the mitigation that uh, we rolled out, we learned that uh, the communities somehow have limited resources to put up enclosures that are uh, of standard that we recommend. And this um, enabled us to start up uh, a program where we adopt farmers that are proactive to the teachings that we give them and assist them with uh, additional materials to reinforce their bombers further. And that takes us to the next slide. After uh, the, our assistance together with uh, uh, the measures that the, the people are proactively putting in, uh, we are able to come up with uh, improved predator-proof enclosures that are safe for uh, communities' livestock. And uh, what we have here is just basically another design of a predator-proof enclosure, and this one we call it uh, the bamboo predator-proof enclosure. This one is basically made to uh, protect cattle from uh, predation by the carnivores. And uh, the beauty about this design is that uh, it reduces the visibility of uh, the cattle while it's in the enclosure, and that reduces the vulnerability of uh, cattle to attack by the carnivores. Next slide. Aversive conditioning is also one important uh, tool that we use for uh, deterring the carnivores from human settlement areas. This is basically a program where we share various uh, lighting and noise making equipments to help deter the carnivores from uh, human settlement areas. And uh, this has also been very effective in deterring uh, some of uh, the carnivores that we monitor from human settlement areas. Next slide. Information that we get from our research team uh, is also very useful uh, to mitigating human kind of conflict in that uh, uh, we have some information that we get from uh, colored, animal, uh, colored animals and that information is also very useful for us to uh, send an early warning message to people that live uh, in conf various conflict hotspots and it's been a very effective tool to help us uh, uh, protect uh, livestock from predation and of course, uh, just uh, raise awareness on what the community is supposed to do uh, for particular forms of conflicts that are experienced in their area when the carnivores are close to their area. Some of the lessons that we've learned is that uh, livestock keeping is ongoing as it is motivated by various factors. Uh, we've also learned that uh, the different species of livestock that are attacked across the ecosystem. And uh, of course, there are also different modes of attack that we uh, are experienced. We've also learned that uh, uh, human kind of conflict is driven not just by encroachment as earlier perceived and poaching, but uh, it is motivated also by various factors such as uh, poor heading practices, livestock slipping out of enclosure and livelihood programs that are uh, done by various uh, 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 parties, uh, 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 our government also been a, a big part of that through the Ministry of Agriculture. We've also learned that uh, the conflict across the ecosystem is mainly caused by uh, lions and hyenas, but uh, we've also recorded some cases where a kind of a conflict has mainly uh, has been caused by uh, leopards. Uh, all these that I've uh, talked about to uh, is basically an implementation of uh, uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Policy that was uh, approved in 2018, uh, specifically from uh, Section 7.5, where it's talking about uh, minimizing uh, human kind of conflict. And uh, the first section uh, of uh, 
the, the first part of that section is basically talking about uh, uh, developing measures and guidelines on human kind of conflict mitigation. And that's why our work is more focused. Then the second part, that's where I've identified uh, to have uh, a gap in our system in our country. Uh, a point that is talking about uh, the development of a national human wildlife conflict mitigation strategy. Uh, I believe, I should believe uh, from 2018, uh, this document has not been published. Uh, either it's in process or uh, the processes have not started. This is a very useful uh, tool for us to mitigate various forms of uh, kind of a conflict uh, and uh, other forms of conflict across the country. Uh, those are just some of our important partners that we have uh, on the ground for various uh, uh, aspects of our work. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very, very much for that excellent presentation. Um, wonderful case study, wonderful field work to hear from. Um, and to all three speakers, uh, it was super interesting to hear these, uh, to hear about your projects and your work. Um, what we're going to do now, we've got a little under half an hour to have a discussion with the speakers um, and the participants. And we actually, we've been collecting questions in the background because there have been a lot of questions in the chat coming in. Thank you for those. Um, and we're trying to look at those uh, as we go. But I think what I will do is start with some specific questions to the speakers, and then we might zoom out again and look at the, the bigger picture questions because we have a nice mix of those. Perhaps I could start with, let me just check where we got some specific. Okay, a, a few quick ones that people are curious about. Um, Russell, for example, the cost of running a GPS collar installment. Um, this is a common question. What is it? What kind of, what are the ballpark costs of running these kinds of things? Look, the, the system is expensive. Um, and, and the bulk of that comes from satellite costs, um, which, which if you live in Europe or North America, US dollars, Euro, probably not that significant. But when you live in Namibia and operate in Namibia dollars, very expensive. An example would be a, a satellite collar over here in Namibia is going to cost us about 42, maybe 45,000 Namibia dollars, and that's worth two years satellite time. Does that kind of answer yep. that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, scanning through, do we, we've also got a number of questions, actually, recurring questions about the species that are, that are the focus of these projects. Now, of course, keep in mind, we're presenting here three SOS projects that, that were, um, that are focusing on these high high profile human wildlife conflict species. However, um, I see several questions, for example, about what about primates? What about um, uh, boars? What about all sorts of other species, which I am sure all of you, even though you're focused on lions and, and elephants and tigers, are, you also encounter, encounter complaints about these others. Um, maybe I can pose that question to Meda. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. Um, yeah, actually, whenever we have been anywhere in any meeting about conflict mitigation, people come up with uh, boars, macaques, and uh, and whatnot, but uh, deers also sometimes ungulates. Uh, but, but then uh, the major issue here is they do not cause uh, human loss or injury, so which basically... Uh, diverts the focus to the ones which are basically causing more panic when it's a human loss, which is more in terms of a leopard or a tiger, lion, crocodile. So that is the reason macaques and primates are like not in the list of priority when we are trying to address. And most of them have got into human dominated landscapes and they have adopted and like adapted to that surrounding. So this is basically what I had to say about this. Thanks very much. The other speakers, any, do you um, face challenges of being pressured to deal with multiple species? Not so much. Yeah, I could 
could could just pass a comment there. Yes, we we do have a lot of um, other issues, and in fact, in our area, um, livestock losses to hyenas, spotted hyenas in particular, are um, are more annually than to lions. However, there's an emotive component with lions, and lions are are or seen or perceived as a threat by communities. And so that is why our focus is on them. Thanks, I would, um, I would second that also, that whenever you have a very high profile iconic species, especially direct threats, as Meda just said, to people, direct safety threats, it draws all the attention. But of course, perhaps the, the, the opportunity there is to then use that in an almost umbrella way and try and address the other kinds of human wildlife conflicts there too, um, and but certainly appreciating the comments here from from several people in the um, in the audience that, for example, primates are definitely in many cases causing as much, if not more, concern. Um, yeah. Let me see. Yeah, and please jump in with further comments. No, okay. Um, there was there were some questions about insurance models or compensation models. Perhaps that's one for there's a, a question from Hamza, but is a livestock insurance model being explored to reduce the incidence of retaliatory killings, Madam? In the Sundarbans. Sorry, maybe I didn't get your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right, Dennis, sorry, uh, you were wanting, you wanted to comment? Yes, I was, I was saying I, I didn't see hear your question clearly. Maybe you can come again. Um, it was a question around insurance. Are any of your three projects exploring insurance or other financial instruments? Okay, so, so maybe basically from uh, our, our, our country, um, most of our, our wildlife activities are guided by uh, the uh, National Parks and uh, Wildlife Act, and uh, that basically does not support uh, any form of uh, compensation for, for, for wildlife. So I should believe uh, uh, the, uh, that policy falls under that, and uh, if uh, it's not supported by the, the acts any uh, we can't throw it down on the ground and uh, yeah. Thanks, Dennis. And actually staying with your project, we have a question from Sri Lanka about whether you think that human wildlife coexistence with elephants and carnivores is possible. I guess this is a in, in, in the ultimate sense. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, Human wildlife coexistence with um, carnivores and elephants, is it is something that is possible? Uh, the answer is yes, it's possible, but uh, there are so many factors that we have to look at if we are to arrive at uh, uh, coexistence. Uh, generally, um, wildlife conflict in general is very complex and, uh, and uh, dynamic, uh, implying that uh, uh, the mitigations that uh, you find today and draw out may or may not work tomorrow. So implying that uh, we th there has to be high investment for, because, because for us, uh, we have to keep on uh, finding ways to mitigate uh, these forms of conflicts generally, uh, either carnivore or elephant. And uh, that will need the, uh, high investments if we are to uh, successively coexist with um, uh, uh, wildlife. Thanks. Can I pose that question to Meda also? What do you see as the long-term future for coexistence in the Sundarbans? Uh, that's, the, you know, the coexistence models are usually very tricky, but then, but then coexistence is the future. If we do not coexist, then how do we do it? Like they have equal share of living and equal share of being there. Otherwise we would be like making another species extinct and the earth or 
the lands do not belong to us only if we want to talk about it like that and if we have chosen to be in any landscape for that matter we have to respect each and every component of it whether it's a wildlife whether it's a deadly wildlife per se or if that is what people want to perceive so we can coexist and that's how people have been doing for ages and years and now all, all these things are coming into the picture because of people want people are expanding uh you know expand exponentially into different landscapes and looking for more and more livelihood opportunities and the most dependence is on the natural resources so that is what is hindering or is a threat to those coexistence models so if we can address them and i i, I think i'm sure that we will be able to address the threats to coexistence and we'll be able to make it Absolutely. Thank you for that. And with that, actually, I might pose a question to all three of you because this has come up um, several times in different formats in the questions. But what about the what about the framing and the wording conflict versus coexistence? This is a question that is so often posed and we have several participants asking, for example, um, would it be good? Uh, this is from Nicholas King in the audience. Would it be good to remove conflict from the primary promise and start with human wildlife coexistence. And I'm curious to hear all three of your views on that. Go ahead, Russell. Um, thanks, Alex. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, you know, we have a, a, a my team of guys. We used to be known as the Human Wildlife Conflict Team, and we changed that to the Human Wildlife Support Team, and um, for that very reason. And and certainly that that had an impact. Um, if I may, I would just like to, on the, on the whole issue of compensation, we've got quite a strong human wildlife conflict policy in Namibia, and it's applied fairly well, and compensation is, is a critical part of that. Um, it does not compensate farmers or people for the commercial value of livestock or crops, but it does make a contribution which helps to, to kind of offset the loss of it. But it, yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's quite strictly and rigorously managed, but it's very useful indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Dennis, Meadow? What's your view on co using on, on these different framings? Do you talk more about conflict or coexistence? <laughs> So this, this is uh, this is a long-standing debate. Uh, but then, you know, when we are talking about coexistence, the first thing we always look at is uh, the manifestation of conflict or what is driving the conflict. And then only we'll be able to think of coexistence or what what basically spoke about coexistence. So basically, conflict is is the starting point. But where we would want to reach or what we would want to achieve is coexistence whether it is through increasing tolerance among people or reducing retaliation in different landscapes. So co coexistence is you know, the ultimate goal or the solution to, to the conflict thing that we are talking about. So often we have been saying we would want to rephrase conflict to interactions, negative interactions, but these are all those play of words which which uh, coexistence quite surpasses, and that is what we should be focusing more on. Okay. That's that's all from my side, Alex. <laughs> Thanks, Meda. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe just uh, to chip in, uh, uh, I think I I'll go with uh, Meda. Uh, I, I actually, uh, there is more uh, to to focus on. And uh, the biggest component is uh, coexistence, and um, uh, that, that's a, that's a milestone uh, that will require uh, a lot, of course, for us to 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 achieve. Because I should understand uh, in places that are, uh, are highly infested with uh, conflicts, not just kind of a conflict, but also other forms of conflict. I think the feeling for the people is. Uh, uh, for us, people uh, who manage this conflict or conservationists, we care more about uh, uh, wildlife uh, than people. 
uh, and uh, that on its own uh, is actually a big factor that uh, we have to look into clearly if we are to achieve uh, coexistence because the moment the people uh, have that feeling, uh, it, will, it, it will make it very challenging for us to achieve what we want uh, generally. Absolutely, thank you. Um, it's interesting also when you get into the question of, you know, at that intergovernmental level, should we be, even for something like the target in the CBD, should we be framing it as conflict or coexistence? Now, imagine if we had to try and, imagine how difficult it already is to measure human wildlife conflict, um, even in your projects, and you're all monitoring different aspects of that, try and do that across the world. Um, now try and ima imagine trying to measure coexistence, which is even bigger. And so does that mean keeping track of every positive coexistence every time that, uh, you know, an animal is in your own garden and it's all fine, you, we cannot possibly, and it's, there's no purpose to monitoring all that. But so just to bring it back to to what is what we're trying to do globally here is try and figure out that balance between looking at the conflict that's what's drawing our attention to this issue but also always keeping that aim of coexistence in mind um <laughs> so i've got another interesting question here from belinda stewart cox about um, acknowledging that every speaker here has um talked about the importance of the full participation and collaboration of communities what about going beyond into other sectors education health agencies other ngos to what extent are you looking at that level of comprehensive or holistic approach i see meda nodding would you like to pitch in yeah yeah thank you so much for posing this actually uh, yeah i wanted to talk about uh, this particular thing about including other land departments and other, other departments into this idea or into this uh, conflict resolution or conflict mitigation programs. So where we are doing a lot of things around education, education centers, meaning schools and colleges. So, so we are not only engaging with uh, school children, but also with teachers where we are developing manuals for teachers on how to engage children into this uh, particular species like whatever species is there at uh, in that particular landscape it's not that sometimes we only do not talk about tigers because those are those are the target species or iconic species there and who are causing conflict in that particular landscape but we also talk about the landscape in general like about climate change for example because all of these are interlinked and most of the times when we are talking to children we kind of talk about just one species which we think has the major impact in that landscape and we forget to mention about like approaching it uh, in a holistic manner so here we are trying to give those to children and as well as to teachers so that they keep sustaining about it and we have also started with some programs like tiger scouts so we identify a few children from those schools and we kind of engage them in uh, in a more uh, you know, specialized training we give them and we send them for transboundary exposures also so that uh, they can speak out in the community. They can they can help uh, speak not only in their school, but also with, the, with their parents and with their other community members. Not only this, we are also developing a lot of activity packs for children. So the engagement is not only in terms of uh, conversational, it is also in terms of deeper engagement, which is, uh, which is through a lot of activities, board games, books, comics, uh, small movies. And we are going till that level to kind of imbibe in, in the kids or children from the beginning itself. So, so that, is, that is another approach. Like I just covered one section of it. And I think uh, that makes sense to what I, I hope I did make sense in this context. Absolutely, thank you. Um, how about the others? Yeah, maybe maybe just uh, to to come in on that aspect. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, community engagement, uh, one of the things that is very very critical for us to uh, achieve coexistence is. Uh, uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, looking at uh, 
generally in conservation, uh, we look at uh, different aspects. Also, not just uh, uh, engaging conservationists, uh, other entrepreneurs also have got uh, a part to play. I'll highlight an example uh, where, for example, uh, as the uh, uh, officers that uh, have a role to uh, mitigate kind of a conflict, for example, will go in the community and uh, try to encourage the community to clear the villages as much as possible. And uh, another case where a forest officer is trying to uh, encourage more of a conservation of forest. So for us, we would do it uh, for another reason, which is a genuine reason that, uh, you know, we reduce as much cover as possible so that there is no livestock predation or there are no human injuries and death. But at the same time, other, part, uh, other parties also have an objective to achieve. And uh, by engaging uh, one another, uh, I think it will help us to come up uh, with the one common goal. And at the end of the day, that will, be, that will create a common ground for coexistence for everybody. Go ahead, Russell. Thanks, uh, both Meda and Dennis. Yes, I, I appreciate a lot of what you're saying there and relate very strongly to it. We're not quite doing as much as I would like to see from an educational point of view, but we do have um, one of our staff who's, whose prime function is advocacy, and this takes it to um, traditional leadership platforms and forums, which are still very um, strong and, and um, influential in the areas where we were, and also with regional political bodies. Um, so we do, we, we invest a lot of time and effort in ensuring that they understand the actual scope of the problem, what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it. I think that's important. Thanks. Um, thanks, Russell. Um, so what's interesting, Okay, let me just check. So let's bring this back to, we've got a few minutes left. Two observations here. One is that what we hear a lot in when we do these kinds of presentations is, but what about this species? And what about this angle? And have you forgotten this? And have you considered this? And I, I think uh, my fellow speakers will, um, will find this familiar. Um, I can guarantee the audience that these three projects are covering a lot more than they had a chance to present in their 10 minute slots today. These are, I know from this ex seeing this excellent work on the ground, these are very well thought out comprehensive uh, projects that are really, really trying. Um, and any of, I think many people in this audience have worked on human wildlife conflict directly. That's why you're here and interested. Um, you will appreciate how constantly changing these systems are and how we are, how we are constantly all learning as we go here. Um, and that is, of course, the purpose of a webinar like this also, and it's the purpose of the IUCN specialist group to try and continuously convene all the learning that we're doing together. So let me take this discussion back a little bit to the big picture um, and maybe conclude with two questions. One was, um, how are you, because we're talking about, um, you know, bringing this into the global, intergovernmental global political um, dialogues. So first of all, to the three of you, a quick question of, to what extent are you able to work with the policies and the policy decision-making systems in your countries? Are you able to link your practice on the ground upwards into policy and so that we can take it upwards further into the global sphere. Have you got any thoughts, examples there? Go ahead, please. Okay, so, so okay. Uh, Sorry, okay, we'll start with yeah, Dennis. Yeah, yeah, so um, basically from uh, our ecosystem, uh, everything that I've highlighted uh, is in support uh, of uh, the National Parks and uh, Wildlife Policy that was uh, approved in 2018 uh, uh, with the specific focus on section 7.5 that is talking about uh, uh, minimizing human wildlife conflict 
as much as possible. And uh, the first part of that section is, is talking about uh, uh, developing guidelines to uh, effectively manage human wildlife conflict. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, a key section where we fall in. And uh, that's what uh, basically we are doing for the different aspects of our work uh, to see to it that uh, we support that. And I believe that um, whatever uh, is highlighted in that policy fits into uh, uh, vision uh, 2030 and uh, uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the outcome for uh, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and uh, uh, how uh, it will fit this uh, specific aspect in there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Russell, did you have a hand up? Yeah, I, I would just like to kind of pass a comment there. I think in our situation here in, in Namibia, we've got a, a fairly dynamic Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Tourism. And um, for instance, our, our national policy on, on human wildlife conflict management was actually developed with um, enormous amount of consultation um, from, from ground level going right through up to scientist level and input. Um, is it perfect? No. And every couple of years, it is due to be revised and monitored and checked. Um, sometimes I think we 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 spend more time um, allowing members of communities out there to realise the full scope of that document and what their rights are as well. I think sometimes that's that's not quite um, there. But I think the the document itself and the impl implementation of it, it broadly is is quite positive. Thanks. Meta, did you want to comment? Uh, yeah. So basically in this uh, in this area, when uh, so the, it has got greater acceptance in terms of creating primary response teams. So recently we had a, a wildlife conflict mitigation action plan where, where this was uh, this kind of feature majorly where they were emphasizing on primary response teams and creating first-hand responders from the local community. So this is one. And the second program is, uh, which is again coming to a, not like a policy level thing, but then it has got greater acceptance at government levels is providing alternative livelihoods. Like uh, giving people alternative livelihood opportunities, not, in, not only in terms of livelihood opportunities, but also taking it up to the market level not only kind of catering to the demands, not only kind of generating some product, but also creating or allowing market linkages. So these kind of opportunities and these kind of uh, pharma producer companies are being promoted and are being facilitated by a lot of government agencies in Sudabans. If I have to talk about Sudabans alone, then there is something called Bonful Hani. So those kind of things are being taken up uh, by a lot of government agencies. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I'm trying to have a look in our last two minutes for a few final pressing questions. Um, I'm seeing one comment from, I think it was Eva Gross, who puts to us the question, um, all these examples show how human wildlife conf uh, conflict coexistence is so connected to um, various SDGs, as well as climate change and many of these other uh, global, global issues that are constantly discussed and, and, and pressing on the world right now. Um, do, you, do you think that human wildlife conflict is a topic that needs to be mainstreamed into additional international policy framework rather than being treated in isolation? That was the question put. Well, I'll share this with my fellow panel members, but I would say that that is, that is exactly what, what's starting to happen here. This is why this is actually an exciting time for this topic, for this biodiversity conservation challenge, because this is actually the first time we are seeing it in the text of a convention at this level. I would suggest that this might be the first step towards, hopefully, further integration into other spheres of 
collaborations around the world on big, big conservation issues. Um, I, I think what we've seen very nicely today from the three examples um, and also from the examples um, you have given us on how you are monitoring even just the, your own regions, um, how much of a challenge we have here with the interplay of scales. So we're talking at, you, you've given us examples of how, you, how you're dealing with the issue and all that, that comes into it and monitoring it just in your projects. And then how do we do that for um, 196 countries that are um, that are uh, signatories of this particular convention. So any very quick final thoughts, um, and then I will hand over back to Anna for wrapping up. Yeah, maybe uh, I can come in. I, I can come in uh, on that. Um, generally, I think. He, a human uh, wildlife conflict has to be mainstreamed. Looking at uh, it's got a higher impact on conservation. Looking at um, uh, the problem is between two parties and uh, one part, which is wildlife, uh, doesn't use logic. They use experience. So implying that uh, uh, in whatever they do, uh, for them, they, they, it's not causing a problem. They do it, uh, you know, as a normal thing and uh, as one of uh, their daily activity. And there's a part here that needs the high engagement, which is the uh, the, the human part. So, uh, in a way, we need to uh, do a lot of uh, engagement. In short, that's why I was talking about uh, we need to uh, do a lot of investment uh, on this because uh, generally, if uh, this part, uh, if if the human part uh, still feel they they are not valued by us as the scientists and the conservationists, uh, they are not valued uh, compared to wildlife. Then uh, this problem will will keep on uh, coming up, and uh, in the end, it will become very difficult for us to uh, achieve the main goal, which is coexistence. Thank you. Thanks so much, <laughs> absolutely spot on. Um, and, and this is the reason why we've got, to, we've got to see this as a human and a wildlife issue. This has come up in several questions as well. I'm terribly sorry that we have not been able to answer all questions, there were many, many, but I hope that we've tried to cover a range of different discussion points here. I need to bring this to a close. I wanna encourage everybody to keep on sharing their experiences and sharing their ideas. Um, do feel free to use IUCN's resources on human wildlife conflict. They're all on the specialist group websites, a huge library there. Please use it. Please share your thoughts and also tell us what more is needed. Um, I want to hand over to Anna Nieto to close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Um, thank you, everyone. I think that it has been an incredibly interesting uh, session. So from my side, I just want to underline that, uh, you know, the work on the ground is very important to inform the policy debate and vice versa. And that policy decisions might made at a high level condition the work that we can eventually implement uh, on the ground. So just, just, just to give the example that without friendly biodiversity policies, funding is just not going to be put in place for conservation. So from my side, I'm just hoping for an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework that unlocks and enables the necessary action to address human wildlife conflict uh, worldwide. So I want to thank all of you for joining us. Thank you, Alex. Thank you to our speakers and participants for their inputs. Thank you to our interpreters and to the team of IUCN that is behind the scenes and that has made uh, this, this event possible. Everyone keep an eye on our social media channels for highlights of today's discussions. Thanks again and have a good day and see you at the next webinar.